Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Hello everyone, welcome to this session and debate entitled Governing with the Debt. I think Jean-Yves Lorenzi said it earlier. We work a lot on the titles. This title actually has two meanings. Well, actually several meanings because we can have different interpretation when we mean debt. It's actually choosing and fund investment and expenditure for the public, but also investment that could be the counterpart of assets, especially if we think about investments in climate transition and will definitely what will leave for the future generation. Actually, debt can be something positive. We shouldn't only see the negative aspect. And we'll also talk about it at length, definitely during this session. It's also a constraint on future governments, on today's government. And there's a risk because we actually see a lot of debates on the Eurozone fragmentation, but also on the debt in developing countries, in emerging countries, but also in developed and wealthy countries. So obviously, had we done this debate a year ago, we would be, we would have been in a different context. The context has been completely overwhelmed by the increase of the interest rates, the increase of the inflation rate, and the exit of uh, the pandemic with a lot of debts that is that have uh, been in increased as well, and that changes the context altogether. This context is also overwhelming for the following reason. That is actually what I wanted to say as last for my introduction. In the way we think about the policy mix between the budget policy and the monetary policy, we are in a situation which is quite um, uh, strange. It's a bit like the opera, actually. You have uh, men playing the women and the women and vice versa. For the budget policy, especially in France, they deal with inflation when normally it should be the role of monetary policy because we, when we talk about reductions and uh, tax, uh, tax with, uh, rate reductions, it's normally a matter of uh, the uh, monetary policy. It shouldn't be the budget policy, maybe for macroeconomics, but it's not the case for uh, mic microeconomics where it's more inefficient. And then I would like to characterize a little bit. I don't know if there are members of the Banque de France the f or the Central Bank. They seem to deal with budgetary policy in the sense that they are concerned with spreads, with the interest rate, and, and the budgetary policy in general. When we have a policy mix where the monetary fix is on inflation, and the budgetary policy is growth and the sustainability of the debt, it's actually a little bit reversed here from this point of view. So we'll talk about all these points of view. We have a panel, which is exceptional, obviously, to discuss this matter. We'll start with Pierre-Olivier Bourrachin, who's a co-author. I'm very happy, actually, to welcome you uh, for this debate, Pierre-Olivier Bourrachin is an economist of the International Monitoring Fund. He's professor at Barclays. And we have worked on a sev several publications, especially the uh, crisis of the um, debt in the Eurozone. The matter of ha at hand when we talk about debt, and I think that the IMF has certainly thought about this and made reflections. It's the matter of the dynamics of the sustainability of the debt. And uh, against this backdrop, when we talk about the uh, debt stock and also the increase of interest rates and the inflation rate, this can have an impact on European countries, industrial countries, but also emerging and uh, developing countries, thank you for this introduction. We have worked a lot together throughout the years, indeed. I would like to uh, remind you of a few uh, elementary pr principles when we talk about governing with the debt. It's always with the debt, actually. Governing is organizing expenditure, the public expenditure, and especially uh, tax collection, wh whilst respecting the solvency of the state, what the economists call the intertemporal um, constraint of the budget for the state. It's quite tense sometimes, depending upon two variables that are key. 
first we have the real interest rate, the uh, headline interest rate that we can increase. And then we have the growth uh, rate of the, act of the economic activity. That means the fiscal resources that can grow throughout the time. To make it simple, when the state borrows, when it exceeds the growth rate, which is a situation which is quite normal, the weight of the debt actually exceeds the budgetary resources and that reduces the public expenditure. When, on the contrary, the, what the cost of the borrowing actually is, in, is below the growth rate, we are a different, in a different situation and the debt burden is actually lower, less uh, big, and actually that is a better situation. That doesn't mean that there are no budgetary constraints, as some would say and make us believe, but it means that it's actually lighter and the debt burden uh, can be uh, bigger at a lower cost. What has happened throughout the 40 last years? It's actually a uh, lowering of the cost. That means uh, for the, the debt, that, that is what uh, has been said by the economics for, of course, for the emerging and developing countries is different. The reasons actually um, um, manifold. We have the demographic evolution. We have also a slowing of the uh, technology. We have a difference with the rest of the world. All these factors contributed to uh, reducing the actual cost of the debt. And throughout the 40 last years, it was possible from the budgetary point of view to uh, get debts, to underwrite debts. And this actually made constraints on monetary policies that adjust actually the key rates. And we could be facing a crisis situation as we had the financial situation in 2008 where, uh, or the COVID crisis, for instance. So when we had a period during which the monetary space was shrinking and, and then the budgetary uh, space would be increase states actually relied more on the budgetary policy for uh, cycle reasons and got more debts. So to what do we assist now? For one year, we have a reversal of this uh, deep tr trend, and I'm going to talk about it later. We'll see if this reversal will be persisting or, or will be temporary. Why do we have this? Because they've had actually the new occurrence of inflation. Central banks throughout the world the uh, uh, the B ECB, the Bank of England, and the Fed Reserve, they want to, they see that the growth actually is slowing, and they have to uh, manage that with the budgetary policy. The environment where we stand is a, a, an environment where we have m m more space for monetary policy. So I will give you four remarks for, in this perspective. The first one, is that a sustainable change or temporary? Because some of the factors that led to the core actually interest rates, because we, we still see the demographic problem. We have also uh, seen that technology is, is slowing down. There are places where not very strong, so there are some factors that are still there. But there are new factors coming in that could lead us to think that the interest rates will increase in a sustainable way. First of all, we have choices in terms of public investment. We have the challenge of the economic change. We have also uh, energy transition that requires a lot of investments that will actually weigh upon the interest rates. We also have the risk of uh, a reverse or a fragmentation of the global economy that would require us to rethink the, ch the production chains with the investments that would be attached to this. So. Uh, we actually temporarily have to deal with this. And inflations might not be actually controlled by the, bank, uh, by the central banks, and we will have a macroeconomic instability also in the budgetary space that will shrink down as well. That's the first point. And we also have to, have to position ourselves, ourselves towards these actually core interest rates. We'll have weak interest rates where we can support a more important debt in some countries, but we're not sure about it, and we have to be prudent for the future. The second point is actually the problem of inflation. In 2021, what we saw, and in 2022 as well, is that inflation, and especially 
the, the fact that the inflation was a rate, of, the increase of the inflation was a surprise. It wasn't anticipated, and the ECBs and everyone was actually surprised. We thought that it would be temporary, and was not. So it contributed to raising the to um, rising the level of a debt <coughs> in terms of ratio with GDP because when we have negative core interest rates we don't need to repay as much so that could be actually have an effect on public expenditure but also the surprise inflation also had uh, some impact on household expenditure so if public expenditure improved we could say we could use this leeway to support households and the activity in a general way but it's dangerous because we are in a context where we have to be prudent on uh, the future inflation dynamisms it can have an impact on the state financing cost we have to do something with the monetary policy and we have to be careful with the budgetary policy and monetary policy which will go in di in opposite directions and this is something that we see in the european context right now and not only in the european context actually third point debt in the eurozone the problem of, about this is that it's quite specific. There's one single currency. All the members have their own budgetary dynamics. And they're slowing down because of the, the war in Ukraine, because of the increase of the key uh, rates, will weigh upon the dynamics of the public finance. And we can see that against this, drugs, this backdrop, we have the uh, perspective of the increase of uh, spreads, actually the differentials between the interest rates for where we have countries where the debt level is actually higher than others. And what happens then is the possibility of a liquidity crisis, namely the market starts to wonder about the capacity of some countries to sustain, to honor their public debt they ask higher interest rates and that will slow down or aggravate actually the public uh, expenditure and that would lead to a, di uh, a situation where we could have a crisis the ecb actually tries to position itself on that style to counter this risk but since as philip said it it's a very delicate delicate balance because we have to strike the right balance between the budgetary policy and the monetary policy i was told to stop there are budgetary constraints as well that apply yes for the emerging countries we'll see that for with the other the other uh, uh, panelists will talk about it the situation is becoming very difficult there as well especially for the countries which are not uh, raw material operators they open up right now and we also have Im imported inflation they have a depreciation of currency they have a problems with their interest rate as well and they have to restructure certainly consider restructuring their public debt in the months and the years to come thank you uh, alors je vais passer la Je vais passer la parole à Olivier Klein. Vous êtes direct. So I'll hand the floor to Olivier Klein, who's the head of Bred HEC, a specialist in monetary and financial questions. And you've just published a book called Crisis and Mutation in the Banking World. And I think at 3 o'clock you're going to be uh, signing copies at the, at the library, at, at the bookstore. So let's... Do you agree with the analysis that Pierre Olivier just made on the impact of inflation on interest rates on debt stock and the question of the sustainability from a public point of view but you're also well positioned on the question of private debt thank you Philippe yes I agree with what was said I'll take this from a few different angles the first point is that we're now we're, we're correcting it's not that uh, inflation was desirable or strong inflation, but there were some economists who said that debt was not important because the interest rates was equivalent to the growth rates, and they thought that it would stay that way forever. And for me, that was an error in thinking, and it prevented us from getting ready for the case where this would change, where the situation would turn around. And even if the interest rate remained below the growth rate, as you very said very well, that doesn't mean that we don't have budgetary constraints. There are budgetary constraints. They were low, but they existed. And still, debt can't increase in an unlimited way without damaging the monetary system sooner or later, even if uh, we have the interest rate below the growth rate. The two main points I would like to address are the following. Firstly, 
to try to quickly see the consequences of inflation and the increase in the interest rates for different actors. My second point will be what can we do for from the point of view of each of these actors, for the central banks fighting against inflation, I've heard, I heard several months ago a few saying the opposite, but now everyone agrees, Flight, fighting inflation is absolutely essential but difficult. Essential because we have to avoid an inflationary regime where the indexation will be set up and where the inflation rate is not low and not stable at the same time. So this will lead to inequalities between households who don't all have the same capacity to react and protect their purchasing power. And that leads to inequality between companies that don't all have the same capacity to pass on prices uh, based on their d demand for their product. The past has proven that when we deregulate in terms of stability, forecastability, the confidence is lacking between economic players, between the producers and consumers, between producers and those who are demanding, uh, because uh, we have to redefine prices several times a year, and that d disorganizes the process and removes confidence. Why? Because between employees and companies, and I see this in my company, we all see it right now in all companies, we are people people are asking for a second uh, annual negotiation and there's a lot of pressure and that's understandable but it, it disorganizes the reliability of the negotiation process between the, the employee the employees and managers that creates tension but when low inflation I exists this does not happen the inflation rate is stable and we don't have to deal with this issue then there's a problem between lenders and borrowers i have i see cases constantly since the beginning of the year my the bankers don't know how to define rates with respect to the requests for loans, be they from companies or from households, as soon as they've defined a rate, if the borrower wants to withdraw it three months later, the rate will have radically changed between day, day, the deed day and the time that they take the loan. So there's a real tension between borrowers and lenders. There's a uh, uncertainty destroys the trust, trust destroys growth. We need to trust as the basis of our economy. We need to fight against this, so we need to keep inflation low and stable, 2 3%, uh, and stable. However, for the central banks, it's in, they must fight against inflation. This is their role. It's difficult, nevertheless. It's difficult, in my opinion, because there have been long and short rates, too, too low for too long. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have done this during the 2007-2009 crisis, and I defended this point. I also defended it during the pandemic. But once growth was back in 2016-17, et cetera, keeping rates so low because the natural interest rate was low, supposedly, because in, rea in reality it built two things that the, uh, the bank has described it for decades now and I don't and I believe in and that is when we have an interest rate that is too low with respect to the growth rate for too long and we're in a growth phase this creates bubbles it creates share bubbles real estate bubbles and it also creates over uh, over indebtedness as you said Pierre Olivier over indebtedness of states like a private uh, households and this is easy because the interest rates are below growth rates so interest is uh, low and you can pay your debt back easily. What is the consequence of this? Overly low interest rates over long periods means that now we have to bring rates up because of inflation. Central banks are in a situation of risk. They could create insolvency for companies and even with companies with very high debt levels, not compared to 2007 and 9, but prior to that, in France in particular and across the world, in, in China, that it's even higher. States naturally can have solvency risk depending on the level of their debt over GDP, but also their primary deficit and their current deficit. And in and France is not that well positioned in in terms of these points. Thirdly, there's a problem for households who can lose purchasing power and who naturally if we don't compensate will create this will create social risks and the risk of developing even higher levels of inflation so the central banks are uncomfortable uh, right now
given this situation. Of course, if we bring interest rates up too much, the bubbles will burst and the insolvency will lead to over indebtedness and the bubbles arise be, uh, rose because the interest rates were too lo low for too long and will create a recession if the bubbles explode too quickly. So there's a risk for growth, there are risks for society, social risks. So what should we do? There's a very narrow path, but the path exists, but it's narrow. For central banks, they must have their credit rate uh, aligned with inflation, but they must be clear in their message with a strong determination to fight against inflation, but it must be gradual and prudent in their actions because if they go too quickly, they will actually provoke problems. So the actors need a bit of time to adapt while we progressively increase rates, not brutally because that would be disastrous for financial markets. Secondly, without being under the uh, fiscal domination, but under the domination of the markets, sometimes the central banks are so afraid of markets that they're being dominated by the markets. The two types of domination exist. We need to avoid both of them. For governments, governments only have a single choice in my mind. They have to show that they're on the pathway of credible sol solvency in the medium term. They going. They don't want to destroy growth by reducing public expenditure, but if they do nothing, they will be exposed to the risk of credibility on their solvency, and that's going to be considerable, and the risks are high in the short term. It's going to be difficult. We have to have public uh, managing of our public finances without austerity, but we need to take better control over our public finances in several European countries. We need to finance the necessary investments for potential growth. Some of these investments are indispensable and for green growth, and yet we have to undertake structural reforms not for austerity purposes, but to increase our growth potential. And if we increase growth potential, that is uh, perfect. For companies, all the companies that are overly indebted, there are ratios. Even the European Central Bank has a ratio that they're asking banks not to go beyond or only in a rare and justified manner when debt is above six times their EBIT. So we need to be very attentive to this point to the companies that whose level of indebtedness is too high they have to have to reduce their level of debt and everyone has to continue to try to bring their ebit up so for the households there's the question of purchasing power it's difficult to protect all of this at the same time because for companies if we in 82, 83, there was a law that was passed that it still exists that prevents companies in France from systematically indexing their wages on prices because Berry, Gauvois, and Delors were dealing with rampant inflation, and there weren't 50 ways of trying to control this, though they needed to index this. So there's a law that makes this impossible now. There are difficulties. If companies do it, they will precipitate overinflation and destroy their level of competitiveness with other companies. And because of this, they'll reduce their possibility of investing later, and naturally they'll be have to review their loans. So it's difficult to have companies do everything at the same time, a bit but not everything. For the states, it's impossible. They cannot cover in their budget all of their problems. They are their room to maneuver is increasingly limited, and I've just explained why. So the last point I want to say as a little twist, but also not so much of a pirouette, we're in a specific situation where we need to reduce inflation, we need to protect purchasing power, and we have a shortage of labor. Companies in France and elsewhere are lacking staff. If we bring our wages up a bit, if people work more, in France, we have the lowest level of work uh, hours of all equivalent countries. This uh, is not unhealthy or idiotic. If people agree to this, a bit more money for working more because companies are lacking uh, staff to uh, grow. It'll be good for growth, good for public finance, and good for our uh, trade in France. Thank you. So Carlson, you're really at the heart of the topic of debt because you're the vice president of Moody's Investor Services and you're in charge of sovereign risk questions in Europe. So the question for you is, are we at the dawn of a new debt crisis in the Eurozone? And how do you see the evolution in particular of the cost of debt 
which will potentially have a huge impact on this type of risk that everyone's talking about again now. Thank you, Nudi's great grade sovereign debt. So it's not surprising that the importance of the debt and its evolution must be predictable, and that's a key factor in our analysis. We look at debt, we consider it important. It's forecasted pathway depending on the wealth of a country and its capacity to grow their wealth. This capacity is linked to governance and to the solidity of the institutions of the country. To summarize, we believe that the economy and the institutions of a company, the stronger they are, the higher the debt level can be. And I would like to stress the fact that the cost of debt is at least as important as the, the amount of the debt. The reason for this is that if the interest payments are important in developing the budget, the, the share that's available for the investment in the short, medium, and long term will be reduced, and the social cost could turn out to be very high. So now I'd like to raise my second point. Since 2020, rich economies and emerging markets have followed two different trajectories. For rich countries as a whole, the potential growth rate will not have been impacted by the pandemic. Despite an important increase in outstanding debt, the cost of debt went down and continued to go down because of very accommodating monetary policy. The situation in emerging countries is much more complicated. Some have shown resiliency with respect to the pandemic, and I think in particular of most Eastern European countries, whilst others will see a decrease in their potential growth rate, and that is the case of several countries in the Caribbean or in Africa. As a group, emerging markets have seen a deterioration in the cost of debt. Some of them will have seen the risk of sovereign credit increase due to the shock of the pandemic. This is the case for countries where growth is structurally lower and where interest charges are higher and that they are dealing with important challenges in the long term like climate change and social pressure. This brings me to my third point. The global economy has been through a, a whole series of shocks in the last 12 years with the pandemic, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, with inflation that's higher than we've seen in more than a generation, with the increase in interest rents, of interest rates in advanced economies that's increasing the cost of international lending for wealthy countries. These shocks can be managed. These disturbances can be managed, but the challenges are increasingly important. However, the time of the decline of the cost of debt is over. Many governments were not, did not take advantage of this very favorable monetary policy to set up reforms, macroeconomic and budgetary and structural reforms. The consequence of this is that some governments will be confronted with two, with political choices that are even more difficult than they were dealing with four years ago. These constraints can still be felt today and will be felt earlier for countries that issue debt linked to inflation or with variable interest rates, such as Italy. The emerging markets are dealing with a new deterioration of the cost of debt. The increase in the price of food and energy, which are non-discretionary consumer spending and we represent a higher share of household consumption for households with low revenues, and this contributes to social tension.
This could aggravate pressure on expenditures while governments are trying to mitigate the impact of the increase in prices on the public. The consequences on the quality of sovereign credit will depend on the starting positions with respect to three points, the burden and accessibility of debt, the solidi institutional solidity, and policies. Debt is very heavy for certain African countries because they have to deal with high uh, reimbursement levels as of 2024. Thank you. It's not only Italy which has actually debt-linked inflation. I think in France we have 10% as well, yes. It's actually all good. You managed to finish on the developing countries and the matter of debt. Actually, that allows me to transition to Vera Sangue. Hello, you're the Deputy uh, Secretary General at the UN and a member of the Economic Commission for Africa. The question of debt actually is very important and it's uh, actually gaining momentum, especially for developing countries and especially Africa. And we, what we want to ask you is how can these countries get out, alleviate the debt burden? Can restructuring happen in terms of debt? Is it on the agenda? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I am in uh, Addis Ababa where the temperature is half what it is out there. I think you guys are at 30 and we're at 18. So you see me drinking tea while uh, I see uh, Philippe is in an open shirt. So uh, I should have been there with you. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not. Um, let me let me focus maybe on three things. I, I think uh, as, as all the panelists have said, the two Olivier's, uh, um, you know, we are living through a, a huge turn around in overall policies, fiscal policy, monetary policy, but most importantly, structural policies and reforms. I think one of the things we have seen, and I think it was uh, Olivier Blanchard two or three years ago who said that, you know, interest rates were so low, uh, the developed world could, you know, just borrow uh, 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 its debt crisis and towards growth. In the meantime, what we had in the last 10 years is the emerging markets in Africa in particular needing to borrow for investments, but just basic investments, energy, roads, education, digitization. But already we were borrowing, as uh, uh, was already said, at pretty high rates, right? We were going to the markets. So if you take Italy, for example, at 150% debt to GDP levels, but going to the markets at less than 100 basis points, uh, compared to a good performer like uh, Egypt, which was going to the market already at 500 basis points. So already this, what I call dynamic divergence, it was huge divergence in macroeconomic performance, macroeconomic policies, and the cost of debt. So, so even as our macroeconomic policies were strong, the cost of our debt was still very high. And we've been engaging a lot with Moody's to see, you know, what can we do to reduce the cost of debt? Now, of course, we have on top of that, the addition of imported inflation. So what we have is even again, as countries have tried to keep their macroeconomic performance in balance, their monetary policy in balance, and Africa has actually and essentially, particularly if you look at the BCAO region, monetary policy was geared towards growth, keeping inflation low at about 3%, more or less, but really trying to ensure that we could support growth of the economies uh, on the continent. But what we have now is this imported inflation, which is making life a little bit more difficult. As was said, the inflation is having a double impact. Compared to Europe or the United States, where you know the food prices are only 10% of the inflation basket, in over 35% of the African countries, food prices or basic commodities are about 40% of our consumption basket. So you can just, and then of course we are now in a health and, and pandemic situation, you add another 25% to that basket and you begin to see the kinds of tightness that consumers, households are going through today because all of a sudden their disposable income has been taken away by almost 60% from food and health, uh, health consumption services. So governments need additional liquidity. Additional liquidity means going back to borrow resources and or 
go to the IMF, go to the World Bank uh, for concessional uh, resources. The interesting thing is that what we call concessional resources for the developing world are actually still more expensive sometimes than what, you know, Italy and Spain and, you know, uh, uh, the European sort of uh, Portugal are getting because they have the European Central Bank behind them that can ensure, even with, I would say, weak macroeconomic conditions, I think we can all agree on that, uh, uh, that they can actually access cheaper, cheaper resources. So what are we seeing on the continent? We are seeing, uh, yes, maybe debt to GDP may not be as high as you see in Europe, but clearly tightening fiscal space, which means that interest payments on debt are going up. So if you have, you take a country like Nigeria, Nigeria has essentially 20% debt to GDP, but its interest payments are almost 30% of its expenditure budget. Right, so Nigeria has no more space. Now, if you add the unfortunate war in Ukraine, you know, and the fact that it has had to increase subsidies both for fuel and also for food, those, those numbers are going up. And so we are beginning to see, I think, a confluence of both li liquidity accelerating into insolvency. And we do need to find some way of, of, of uh, addressing this problem, which essentially most African countries do not have the strength of a strong central bank. We have uh, BCAO in West Africa and BEAC to some extent in, in uh, Central Africa, but most other uh, economies don't have that. So what we need to do is, is in some sense, when I, when I listen to the Europeans today, I almost feel there is something positive coming out of this conversation, which is Europe is entering into an era where a lot of the developing world has been for the last six, seven years, actually since 2008, because this sort of additional and excessive injection of liquidity into the global West started in 2008, accelerated, of course, in 2020, because we overemphasized the response uh, to the COVID crisis. But now we have to pay for it by sucking up some of the liquidity that we put into the system. Unfortunately, we put too much liquidity in the West and not enough liquidity in the South. And today we are trying to suck up liquidity from both ends. And this will not work. We need to find some way, of course, of seeing how we converge uh, at these policies. We need, I think in 2008, we were talking about new and unconventional monetary and fiscal policies that were being put in place. I think the time has come again for us to start thinking about those things. And the final point I want to make is a point that was made by Olivier. In terms of labor markets, I think this is so, so critical. It's for us to be able to come back to some kinds of good macroeconomic balances, we need to look at labor market policies, not just in the West, but also in the emerging South. Because I think until we are able to bring these two labor markets uh, together to some kind of acceptable equilibrium, we will not be able to come back to, I think, macroeconomic stability and see the kind of growth that the world experienced over the last 10 years. Thank you. Merci, merci Vera. Thank you. I would like to ask a few questions and I would like to answer them. I would like you to answer them quite swiftly, especially if we want to have a Q&A session with the public. I will start first with Javera. Uh, so we'll start first with the debt in Africa. What role could be played in terms of debt structuring? Do you think that it's something that that we have to work on, especially the IMF and the World Bank and the public and private donors and the role of China as well, because we haven't talked about it for uh, the African debt. Sorry, you have one minute to talk about this, Vera, which is a very broad question, right? Yes, of course. I think it's something we have to work on. I think, unfortunately, the truth of the matter is that the common framework does not work. We've been working on the common framework for a year and a half, and it does not work. What countries need immediately is new liquidity so that we give a little bit more time for the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the Chinese and everybody else to come together to sort of put together a new debt framework. And by the way, I don't think we need a new debt framework just for low income countries. Argentina needs a new debt framework. Probably Italy needs a new debt framework. So we actually do need uh, to sit down and think about that in the meantime. I'm saying let's issue new SDRs, give countries the liquidity they need today to be able to at least ensure that they stave off any social unrest. We have two things we can do to provide immediate liquidity, new SDRs, and secondly, extend the debt service suspension initiative, two very good initiatives from uh, the G20, which I believe we should continue to support. Thank you. <laughs> 
Ok, merci. Sarah, j'ai bien compris que vous. I see that you didn't want to answer to the question about the fact about whether there will be a debt in the eurozone coming up, but. With the situation in 2011 and 2012, where we had a, a crisis in the eurozone, eurozone, are we in a different situation today, or in which way are we not? I will answer in English. I think there are some important differences between uh, the European sovereign debt crisis and where we are today. Uh, on the one hand, yes, debt levels are higher. But I think there are two important strengths that Europe didn't have before that it has now. It has different crisis fighting tools. Before, we didn't have the ESM, uh, the EFSF, uh, different approach, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, different, more innovative monetary policy tools. Another subject, and we haven't mentioned it at all today, is uh, the banking sector is much stronger in Europe right now than it was uh, on the eve of the European sovereign debt crisis, which I think is a really fundamental importance. I think there is one subject, and I'm surprised none of us have talked about it yet, so I'm going to put it, I'm going to take the liberties and put it on the table, which is fiscal rules, les règles budgétaires, um, because there were changes to, uh, to the European fiscal rules after the crisis. It's a subject that keeps coming up. Um, and in a monetary union that is fairly heterogeneous, uh, the existence of fiscal rules is important, not just because of the kind of policy predictability that it gives, but also because those rules aim to reduce that heterogeneity, which is one of the fundamental uh, vulnerabilities of the euro area. Merci. Uh, Thank you. There's also a question that is being asked on uh, online, and I will actually ask it to Olivier. For the debt to be sustainable, we need to have growth. What would be actually the driver that would be the most important one in terms of growth, and especially when we talk about taxes and levies? or monetary policy? What would be the most important driver for growth? In France, you mean? I think, actually, it's more general, it's broader. The question was asked in English, so I guess, actually, we're not talking about France only. You have one minute to answer. For growth, there are long-term investments to make on education. France is not the only one country in difficulty, actually. Education is important to level up to upgrade education, to be a country of knowledge so that actually we can have a cutting edge, we can keep being at the cutting edge in terms of technology. This is indispensable. In the short term, re uh, pension reform. I know that with the previous act, this is where we're going, but we should speed up the process. This would allow us two things, to do two things. We would have more balance in uh, public expenditure and have some leeway also for the public expenditure. The two of them are actually not incompatible. It depends how we actually uh, uh, allocate our resources. And also, we should have work on the labor market. We need to have uh, people so as to uh, in, uh, have a better growth in the future. This is actually a uh, sh some short-term and mid-term, actually, priorities. Olivier, you have a question on the way the IMF is positioning itself as to the question of uh, funding through death or by other means uh, on green economy and uh, tr energy transition. I have one minute. I'll try to answer that question in one minute then. So climate transition is necessary. We have to find the means to fund that. I think that from the IMF uh, point of view, it is very clear that the funding of green economy should come also partly from the setting up of new funding resources for this transition that would actually support the green transition. And actually, it's the uh, carbon uh, tariff, uh, carbon tax. That's not very popular, but it is actually indispensable for the climate transition. It is actually a source of budget income, a part of which can be 
uh, reallocated to protect vulnerable households, but also the most vulnerable sectors uh, with a decarbonated energy. And part of it can be reinvested to have transition uh, towards a decarbonated economy. The funding of this transition will be done with uh, new budgetary resources. Thank you. We have a bit of time, and I, I see that there's a lot of blue shirts that want to uh, ask questions. We have two minutes. Go on, go on. Come on. You have a mic. Hello. Thank you for this session. I would like to ask the following question. What are the priorities for the government on the use of debt? If they underwrite debt, what are the priority uses for this debt so that it can be sustainable over the long term? You have 30 seconds each. I'll start with Vera. To That's an easy answer. Essentially, you should invest in infrastructure, human capital, but always make sure that uh, the rate of return on the investment is higher than the cost of the debt. Okay, c'est une très bonne règle en effet. It's a very good rule indeed. Is that at Moody's we don't give policy advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Olivier. Olivier. Anything that allows to increase potential growth to, whilst greening the economy. It's very broad, but this is actually uh, reverting back to what was said earlier. I have and not, and not actually invest in operating expenses at the IMF. We do give political advice, uh, unlike Moody's. I think we should have a broad vision. There are uh, investment expenditure for the future on capital, human capital infrastructures that we should do, indeed. But the part of the debt could be used as well to fund transfers. We have a funding system for pension that is actually also debt linked. Debt should not fund only ex uh, capex and uh, infrastructures and internet cables. No. I think we should get into a perspective of a mid-term sustainability. Countries can do, actually, can make different choices. We can have different social partnerships. We can reallocate more to vulnerable households or not. We need to have a five-year horizon to be able to explain to the economic stakeholders, to people, the decision that we make We are it will, able, will enable us still to actually uh, honor our debt uh, obligations and commitments nonetheless. I chair an economic council, so and we are still able to provide advice. This is what I'm going to do. We kept part of our investments in uh, higher education. I'm a professor at the university, so I'm not objective at all. But I think that investment is important for education and higher education because we are lagging behind in an enormous way, in a significant way. Investment and expenditure is not always an easy, an easy paradigm to solve. Thank you. It was actually amazing. It was an amazing session. Thank you to all of you.